Thank you so much for coming. Thank Today's, you for having me. Uh, Brown Bag Lecture is delivered by <coughs> Professor Martin Nedball from the Department of Musicology. Uh, Professor Nedball uh, received his PhD from the Eastman School of Music at the University of Rochester. Um, and uh, he joined the University of Kansas Musicology faculty last fall, for, oh, I mean in the fall of 2016. Um, it, before uh, KU, he served on the faculty of the University of Arkansas. And the information I have here is that your book, uh, Morality and Viennese Opera in the Age of Mozart and Beethoven, appeared with Routledge. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on that. And, thank um, you. Thank you so much for coming. The title of today's talk, as you can see, is Mozart and the Czech National Revival, the Politics of Libretto Translation in Early 19th Century Prague. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, this is uh, part of a, a project that I started working on as I was finishing my, uh, my first book. Um, and as you heard, the first book was about the issues of opera in Vienna, whereas now I turned my attention to Prague. And so uh, I'll report on some of the outcomes that uh, came out of my uh, two summer research trips uh, to Prague. And before I uh, talk about the specific subject, um, I should uh, probably give you just a little bit of historical background. So uh, chances are that you are uh, probably familiar with a little bit of uh, Czech history. And so you might know that the Czech lands um, became part of the Habsburg Empire in 1526. Um, and uh, uh, since then, uh, then Prague, uh, uh, became sort of a secondary city in that empire as the Habsburg family moved their seat from Prague to Vienna and then uh, uh, tried to centralize the empire uh, and uh, effort that uh, peaked in the 18th century when the Empress Maria Theresa and Joseph II uh, moved all the administrative offices out of Prague to Vienna and basically deprived uh, the Czech lands out of, of, of their autonomy. Um, also, they tried to institute German as the official language of uh, the whole uh, western part of the empire, which then raised uh, resistance from uh, the Czech speakers, uh, who then started this pro process in which they tried to revive the Czech language and turn it into a literate language and create uh, Czech language culture and literature in a process that then lasted from the late 19th century throughout or late 18th century throughout the 19th century and was called the Czech National Revival um, and so that's why uh, the, that's the that's the title uh, that's what the title refers to now how does Mozart fit into it it might be a, a little bit surprising because of course Mozart is um, well he was born in Salzburg uh, which is now in Austria and he was a German speaking uh, uh, composer um, However, as we will see, he had very close ties to Prague, um, and even though he spent most of his time, most of his career in Vienna, and uh, uh, he did certain things in Prague that endeared him with the population, um, so that he has been adored there um, uh, ever since the late 18th century. Even nowadays, when you go to Prague, uh, uh, if you did, you might be familiar with the fact that uh, every uh, tourist shop has Mozart puppets and there is Mozart postcards, and you can buy T-shirts saying Mozart, Hard Prague, and 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 <laughs> and things like that. So so he is extremely important, and my. Uh, uh, one of my big questions th throughout my project is to figure out how uh, how did this German-speaking Austrian artist uh, became so important for uh, the Czech and especially Prague identity, um, and so. The, the reason for that actually has to do with uh, his two operas. Um, so he, Mozart spent the last 10 years of his life in Vienna and that's where he wrote his main uh, most famous works, um, his most famous operas such as The Marriage of Figaro or The Magic Flute. Um, but the operas actually uh, weren't that popular in Vienna during his life um, and 
at one point uh, in, in the year 1786 he was invited to Prague to conduct a performance of his, of his Marriage uh, of Figaro, uh, an opera that he composed that year. It was extremely popular and so Mozart was then invited to write an opera for Prague, uh, which he did in 1787 and that opera was Don Giovanni, which then in the 19th century became one of the most uh, uh, important, most famous operas. Uh, Estates Theater remained the main theater in Prague for most of the 19th century. It was only in uh, uh, 1862 that the Czech community built their, built their own theater and so then the Czechs and German communities split um, and uh, uh, but this theater was, was, was the major theatrical uh, institution in Prague for ever since its founding, which was in 1783. So the building was built in 1783 and then it just was the main site for theatrical events uh, for um, over a century. And it's still operational, so you can still go and uh, see uh, Mozart opera performances and other opera performances in there too. Um, so I just want to give an overview of some of these other operas, famous Mozart operas, and how they got to Prague. So I said Don Giovanni and La Clemenza di Tito were premiered in Prague. The other Viennese operas were premiered in Prague very soon after their Viennese premiered. So uh, Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro, which premiered in Vienna in 1786 was then produced in Prague that very same year in 1786 was very important his uh, Mozart's Così fan tutte another Italian comic opera premiered in Vienna in 1790 premiered in Prague in 1791 uh, and then the same with his last opera The Magic Flute uh, which premiered in Vienna in 1791 and then premiered in Prague in in, in 1792 um, so uh, this uh, really turns Prague into a, a very major center of, of Mozart cult where people are venerating his operas and the operas are extremely popular uh, even though in other places it actually takes uh, sometimes even a few decades before uh, the, the operas uh, become important uh, including in Vienna where uh, the operas such as The Marriage of Figaro or Don Giovanni were premiered during Mozart's life, received a few performances, but then disappeared from the repertoire for uh, at least a decade. Um, so, so Prague somehow has this affinity uh, uh, with Mozart and again part of it might have to do with the fact that uh, the Prague citizens realized that uh, Mozart was, was already becoming this, this famous uh, composer and so it was sort of an honor to have this uh, figure of international importance uh, appear in their city. Now, when we look at the later um, um, performances and productions of Mozart's operas in Prague in the next decades, uh, we realize that uh, they, the texts of these operas are gradually changing. So Mozart is writing in a period when uh, most of opera uh, that's written for upper, upper classes in uh, the European society are in Italian. Um, and then there's a, a few, uh, uh, or, or there's an increasing market also for vernacular, uh, opera in, in, in the vernacular language. And that's why he also, he doesn't write only operas in Italian, but also operas uh, in German. Now when we proceed from the late 1780s into the 1790s and the early uh, 19th century, um, there is a rise of interest in opera and theater uh, in the, uh, in the upper middle classes as well, which are more interested in vernacular uh, theater. And that's why these operas uh, that were written in one language uh, in the following decades are only performed in the language of its audience, in the, in the vernacular. And that's why we get uh, then huge amounts of different uh, translations. And so here, here's a very brief overview of, of how that worked. Um, so uh, The Marriage of Figaro was premiered in Italian in Prague in 1786, was 
performed uh, by the Italian company until 1807 when the Italian company in the Estates Theatre was replaced by a German company and so since then it was presented in German as Figaro's Hochzeit uh, which was premiered in 1808 and in fact it was performed in German for the rest of the 19th century. That might be a little bit surprising for us nowadays because when we go to opera houses, uh, operas, the, the tradition is to watch the opera in its original language, but that wasn't the case in the 19th century. Um, eventually there were also um, Czech translations, uh, so uh, of course Prague, I said, was uh, uh, was affected by this Germanization uh, throughout the uh, uh, Habsburg Empire and so a big uh, part of the elites were German speaking but gradually uh, we have uh, the the Czech speaking population trying to start uh, their own cultural institutions as well and so that's why uh, we have uh, German uh, translations and performances and eventually also Czech ones. Um, we can see that with Don Giovanni too which is premiered in Italian but then already in 1792 uh, is uh, performed in German and then in 1825 in Czech. Uh, a really interesting situation happens with Mozart's The Magic Flute which uh, premiered in Prague as I said one year after its premiere in Vienna in 1792 and then by the year uh, 1794 it was premiered in the city or it was performed in the city in three different languages so because it was so popular so the German company continued to perform it in German the Italian company translated it into Italian as Il Flauto Magico and then uh, the, the Czech company then also produced used a Czech version of the opera. So uh, all of that came to a peak in 1794 when as I said there were uh, three different companies performing the opera in that one city in three different languages. Um, so now what I am really interested in my uh, research is uh, the nature of these translations and, and what they tell us uh, about the people and society uh, that produced them. Uh, because as you might know when you translate something uh, it's, it's very hard to stay completely uh, uh, close to the original um, and moreover it becomes even harder when you are translating something that was written in a certain period and then you are trying to translate it for an audience uh, that lives several decades uh, later and might have different preferences and sensibilities and that's why I talk not only about translations but also adaptations so every translation also involves adaptation. Um, just an example, um, I, choose, uh, I chose uh, three publications of the libretto for Don Giovanni. So the first one is uh, the Viennese libretto, Italian libretto of Don Giovanni from 1788. I said that Don Giovanni was premiered in 1787 and written for Prague but Mozart took it with him to Vienna and produced it there in 1788 and so already interesting is to compare the two Italian librettos, the Prague libretto and the Vienna libretto and there is already changes because the audiences in Prague and in Vienna had different tastes. Um, then uh, from, I also chose uh, the uh, Rochlitz uh, translation, German translation of the Don Giovanni libretto as Don Juan which was published in 1801 and uh, became the most widely used German version of the opera in, in the 19th century and again if you went to see this opera in Central Europe in the 19th century you most likely wouldn't see it in Italian um, it would be performed in the vernacular language um, and then finally I have the earliest Czech translation of, the, of, of, of Don Giovanni, also named Don Juan, which was published in Prague in uh, 1825 and was created by Stepanek, um, and I'll talk about him uh, a little bit more. So I want to talk just a little bit about what happens when uh, these librettos are translated and adapted. Um, especially with the Italian op or especially the Italian operas uh, represent a big problem for uh, the 
uh, audiences and authorities of later generations because they were written in the 1780s, which was the heyday of the court, cu court culture. Uh, they were written uh, for these Italian companies that mainly serviced the nobility. And the nobility was cosmopolitan and uh, uh, was uh, speaking several different languages so they could uh, understand Italian. Um, they were also highly educated and highly sophisticated, so the, uh, the librettos, the Italian librettos of Mozart's operas and other operas of the time are also highly sophisticated and, uh, and educated and also now and then contains, uh, uh, contains elements that, uh, that later in the next decades became problematic, especially in terms of morality and politics. Um, as, of course, because uh, 17, as Mozart is writing Don Giovanni in 1787, he has no idea that the French Revolution is going to happen just a few years later. Uh, and so obviously that then makes, as we will see, certain aspects of the opera uh, also very problematic. And also he's writing these operas for the upper classes and nobility, whereas in the 19th century opera becomes more and more in increasingly a middle class uh, issue. Um, and so that's why I talk about adapting the ancien regime works for 19th century middle class. And some of the changes we find out when we compare the librettos are cuts and additions of music and text and sometimes these are really substantial. Again that s might seem very strange to us nowadays because nowadays we live in this museum culture where we assume that the artworks from the past need to be presented to us in the way that, that they were written and in the way the author intended, intended them. And so if you go to see Don Giovanni in an opera theater, uh, the uh, opera company tries to present it in Italian and sort of as close to the original as possible. But that wasn't the case in the 19th century uh, where uh, opera companies and opera directors would cut whole uh, arias and different music numbers. Um, sometimes they would add scenes and arias into, uh, into the operas. Um, Sometimes they would also, through these translations, change the text and the meaning of the text in the arias uh, so that then the outcome uh, completely changes the characterization of the, and the psychology of the characters. Um, and another important thing uh, are poetic changes. So how do you translate uh, Italian poetry, because the Italian libretto especially uh, is a poetic uh, work, so how do you translate the poetic structure of that uh, work into other languages? So I have a few examples that I would like to show of, uh, of uh, portions of Mozart's operas that became problematic in the later decades and also uh, talk a little bit about how uh, different generations of theater uh, productions try to take care of them. So the first uh, example I would like to talk about is this moment from the Act One finale of Don Giovanni. Um, if you don't know the opera, in Act One finale, at the end of the first act, Don Giovanni throws a party um, in, in his house. And to that party, he in, invites uh, anyone who wants to have fun. Uh, the main reason why he's doing it because is that he wants to seduce uh, this peasant girl uh, whose name is Cerlina. Uh, at the same time, however, these uh, three masked figures uh, come to the party as well, which are uh, these three aristocratic uh, characters who are trying to uh, bring Don Giovanni to justice. And so he, he doesn't know that, and so he welcomes them to the party uh, uh, in this very famous moment. So let's, let's watch that.
of course, this call to celebration of freedom, Viva la Libertà, uh, was okay in the court culture of the 1780s in Vienna with just nobility uh, around, but it became very problematic a few years later when the French Revolution happened and uh, uh, liberty became this watchword of all these uh, uh, revolutionary changes that uh, the French were calling for. And so then when we look into these translations ad and adaptations from the early 19th century, then we really find this awkwardness that the uh, translators try to resolve and then they always tr replace the word liberty with something else. Sometimes it's merriment or joy, depending on, on uh, what, uh, uh, what fits their uh, uh, poetic schemes. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very rarely do they stick with freedom and liberty because that came to be viewed as, as very problematic. Another example <coughs> that I would like to talk about comes from Cosi fan tutte. So, Così fan tutte, Mozart's last Italian comic opera, uh, probably one of the most problematic operas by him, especially from uh, the point of view of morality. Uh, the title is, suggests uh, or translates roughly as all women act like that. Um, and basically it's an opera where uh, two lovers, two male lovers, put their female lovers to test, trying to test their fidelity, and the female lovers uh, fall for, uh, uh, for, for, fall for seduction. And so the opera then, uh, it's not exactly clear, but uh, uh, sort of partially argues that all women are unfaithful. Uh, and so as you can imagine, that was fun for the uh, Rococo, court society of the 18th century, this sort of mind games about these intellectual questions, but became very problematic in the 19th century with the, uh, the, the, the moral principles that the middle class was trying to upheld, uh, uphold. Um, and so then the Cosi Fan Tutte is the opera that c goes through a huge amount of different revisions and changes. And I just want to uh, ex exemplify it by looking at this beautiful aria from the act two, where one of the characters, the female characters, her name is Dorabella, and uh, she just was seduced by, uh, by her lover in disguise. Uh, so she fell for her, her uh, in her, in the, she, she, she failed the test and she's trying to persuade her sister, her name is Fiordilici, that she should go for it um, as well. And so she sings this uh, aria about uh, Amor or Cupid and that he's a little thief and he's playful um, and so on. So I'll just play the, the, the music of this uh, so that you have an idea of what it sounds like. So um, clearly the music is very playful and it goes with the playful text uh, which also is filled with double entendre, sort of sexual double entendre. So uh, love is a, a little serpent that crawls into your heart and then eventually by the end of the aria she sings about uh, if in your breast he settles, he pecks you there. Uh, and commands you and you have to do whatever you, uh, he, he wants you to do. Um, so um, it's, a, it's, it's a highly suggestive aria that was pretty typical for the late 18th century court culture, uh, but as you can imagine became problematic in the uh, more uptight 19th century. Um, and so then when we look at the German translation that was used in Prague and Vienna from the 1790s into the 19th century, the translator completely rewrote it. Um, and so uh, if you look at this translation of the German text, first of all, the character is no longer called Dorabella, but Julchen. Um, and she still sings about God Amor, uh, but from a very different perspective. It's especially obvious when you look at the final stanza. In the Italian, 
uh, the character is sort of saying, oh, just uh, you have to do w whatever lover, love wants. Uh, you just have to follow him. Um, in the German, she warns her sister. She says, don't trust the dissolute one. Don't trust the dissolute teaser. Don't trust Amor. So from this playful aria, it becomes this warning against infidelity, um, uh, basically. And uh, it's really interesting because it doesn't really fit with the music, but somehow uh, they needed to do that um, because uh, that was the, it, it, uh, the original text wouldn't fit with the expectations and sensibilities of the audiences and also it most likely wouldn't pass the censors who uh, were increasingly prominent and important after uh, the French Revolution. Um, so uh, that's the German translation. Now I want to move on to what happens when the Czech translations start appearing in Prague. I said that the first Czech translation of Magic Flute was in 1794. Um, it wasn't actually, it, 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 we, we can still study it, uh, but uh, it wasn't that important because it was just performed a few times and then it disappeared. And then actually there weren't Czech performances of Mozart's operas for some time, partially because of the Napoleonic Wars and because the Czech intellectual movement uh, was not very strong. And then it became stro stronger again in the 1820s when in the Estates Theatre that I talked about, a new Czech opera company and theatre company is, is created uh, that's supposed to promote uh, Czech culture and, and Czech theatre. And interestingly, the opera, opera company is created in 1824 and in just the next few years, uh, all of the major Mozart operas are premiered uh, in Czech translations, uh, which shows how important Mozart was for the, for the Czech cultural and intellectual actual movement. Um, and so um, I just want to uh, look at the Czech translation of this aria, uh, which I recently found. So the translation was uh, done in 1825. Um, and uh, uh, the big, uh, I guess, point that I am trying to make about these early Czech translations uh, is that through them, the Czech uh, national movement was actually trying to distance itself from the dominant German culture. Uh, so they were using translation of Mozart operas and of, of other operatic texts to prove that they are different and also maybe that they are culturally significant, maybe even more than the Germans. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, one way th uh, in which they were trying to do this was through authenticity. Um, so uh, they were trying to show that, uh, yes, there's the Czech culture is sort of struggling and is not as prominent in Prague as the German culture, but the Czech performances of these uh, classic operas uh, are much more close to the original than uh, what the Germans are doing. Um, and you can definitely see it in this translation of the aria uh, where we compared the Italian and the German and saw that the Italian was suggestive, the German was moralistic. Uh, the translator, the Czech translator of Cosi Fan Tutte uh, then tries to avoid references to the German text and tries to stay, stay very close to the original Italian text uh, to the point where his aria maybe even overcompensates a little bit for the, uh, or uh, goes a little bit too far with all the suggestive sexual double entendres. So if you look at the, this is the Czech text, the character is now called Krasomila, no, more, no, no, no longer Julchen, and then uh, in her last uh, stanza uh, she sings, when it pricks in here and you are being poked, he stays inside you, a little boy is in your heart. Um, so clearly it's a lot closer to the idea of the Italian text, definitely not as moralistic as the, as the German text. Um, and again, the main, uh, we have letters from the translator, the Czech translator, translator, and he specifically says that he wants to, he doesn't want anything to do with the German translation, that the German translation uh, spoils the spirit of the original Mozart, and that the Czechs in a way are more authentic because they go back to the uh, Italian original. 
But as you can imagine, a text like that created problems in the early 19th century. And so in fact, it was censored. It's, uh, you cannot see it very well, but this is the this is a prompter score of that opera of Così fan tutte. So the score that was used in the theater performances from which the prompter was uh, reading the lines for the uh, uh, singers on stage in case they forgot the lines. And then the great thing about prompter scores is that they show us not only uh, what the exact text was that was actually presented by the singers in the, on, on the stage, but they also show us the changes and cuts uh, and revisions that were made uh, at different times. And so you cannot see it very well, but this is the ending of the aria with the last stanza. Um, and the words from the uh, last stanza of the text, of the Czech text, that, that talk about poking and, 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 and pricking and so on, are actually rewritten in red crayon, um, it's so to, to make it sound more innocuous. Uh, so uh, clearly someone, the translator wanted to be as close to the Italian original, but then someone either in the directorship of the theater or some authority, maybe the censor didn't like that, and so uh, they, they had to change that. Um, so uh, I want to stay with this idea of authenticity um, and, uh, and also of, of, of poetry and what happens in some of these uh, Czech translations. Um, so I said that one part in which the Czech intellectuals were trying to distance themselves from what, the Ger from they, from what their German co-patriots in Prague were doing uh, was by authenticity. The other one was through a uh, versification system. And in the early 19th century in Czech literature, there's this huge debate about poetic style and poetic system. And uh, uh, Czech uh, poetry and Czech language is, um, it has, has accents that lend themselves really well to the uh, what we call syllabotonic uh, system of poetry, uh, where poetic meters and rhymes are given by the natural accents on different syllables of, of words. The problem was that uh, German works like that too. Um, and so the Czech intellectuals, again, in an attempt to uh, distance themselves from what the Germans were doing, created this completely uh, new system, which they called Chasomira. And it was an accentual system in which they decided the metric feet uh, based on sort of mostly randomly assigned lengths of syllables. Um, the idea was that it was very much like what the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans were doing. Um, and the problem was that it didn't work. And so they, they really were into it for several decades in the 19th century, but eventually everyone decided um, that it just wouldn't work. Uh, uh, what's, uh, what's interesting is that uh, when you read the treatises about the accentual system, uh, the Czech intellectuals are specifically saying that one reason why they are doing it is because they want to s separate themse themselves from, from German poetry. Um, and so uh, we can also see it in the translations. Um, so uh, many of these early Czech Mozart translations are in this chasomira, in this accentual system. Um, especially interesting case are these two Don Giovanni translation. So I said that in 1824 the new Czech opera company was created in the Estates Theatre and the Czech opera company obviously were, was interested in uh, performing major works of operatic literature in including Don Giovanni, because that was the most important opera for Prague since it was premiered uh, in the city. And so when the opera company decided to produce Don Giovanni, uh, Two different translations uh, were published uh, in the year 1825. Um, one of them, as I said before, was by Stepanek. Stepanek was one of the directors of the Estates Theatre, and so he was much more practical and pragmatic. And so, in fact, his translation is written in the syllabotonic system um, and is, is based on the German uh, uh, version of the opera that was used by the German company. Um, the other one was by Macháček, and uh, Macháček was part of the more idealistic intellectual circle uh, in Prague, and so his translation is written in this accentual uh, system, in the Chasomira system. 
And so, again, I think this is a great example of how the translations of uh, Mozart's operas are uh, reflecting the different political and social ideologies that the Czech movement was going through in the, in the 1820s. One more thing that I uh, recently discovered about the Don Giovanni uh, production of 18, 1825 um, is that it has to do with this issue of authenticity. Um, so I said that the Mozart operas were often performed with cuts um, uh, soon after they were translated and adapted in, into other languages. And that's precisely what happened in Prague in the early 19th century. The German opera company uh, did extensive cuts. They cut some of Mozart's arias. They even cut the original ending of the opera. Uh, so famously, Don Giovanni ends with this uh, ghost coming to claim his soul and drag him into hell. But in Mozart's original opera, after Don Giovanni is dragged into hell, the other characters c c come back on stage and sort of reflect and moralize about what happened. This, was, this became problematic in the 19th century because of different reasons, romanticism and so on. Um, and so that ending with the other characters was usually cut and it was also cut in the German productions. But the Czech performers decided, okay, we want to be authentic. Uh, we, again, we want to show that we are more authentic than the German company. And so they gradually incorporated all the cut uh, portions of the opera back into uh, their production. And the, the way we can know that and see it is by studying uh, these uh, posters uh, or um, theater bills. Uh, so every day for every uh, daily performances the Estates Theater would publish uh, theater posters and the Czech National Museum has a collection of all the posters uh, from, the, from the 19th century and comparing them is, is, is really interesting because it shows how the performances change, changed from day to day. Um, and so uh, here are the posters for the first two Czech performances of Don Giovanni. Uh, what's really interesting is that it's, uh, it's bilingual, right? It's in Czech and then in German, again, because Prague was a bilingual city and all the elites were German speaking still in the, in the 1820s. But then if you, if you compare uh, what it says about the actual performance, uh, the second performance actually states that it's adding back some of the uh, original numbers from the opera that were cut in the German performances. And also, the German performances interpolated new character uh, characters into Don Giovanni. Uh, it was very typical in Germany that they would just add new scenes. And in Don Giovanni, the new scenes were these com sort of slapstick comedy scenes where Don Giovanni uh, has to deal with these constables who comes to come to arrest him or with a merchant who wants uh, his debt uh, repaid. Uh, and uh, the Czechs cut the, all of that. And again, then they talk about it in their uh, review views of the performances and stress that uh, this, is a, this is a Czech thing to do and that the Germans spoiled the original Mozart and the Czechs are here to, uh, to, to, to bring him back. Uh, which is again very so strange because Mozart is already in the 19th century scene as a German composer yet somehow the Czechs are claiming, uh, claiming him uh, for, for themselves. And in fact that then continues into uh, the 20th century. Uh, so uh, uh, even in the 20th century there's this very nationalistic way of talking about Prague history. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, the, uh, of course we know that the Germans were after the Second World War, uh, they were um, uh, expelled from the country and so uh, from uh, uh, the what is now the Czech Republic had about 30 percent of German speakers before the war and then it's purely Czech and so uh, that also meant the destruction of all these German language cultural institutions that existed for uh, several centuries including the uh, theater and uh, and libraries and so on and so interestingly uh, the, then also 
Czech musicology and Czech literature studies uh, was not interested in the German culture of Prague in the 19th century at all. Um, and uh, so they in fact mainly just focused on these Czech uh, performances and they continued to claim just as uh, the Czech speakers did already in the 1820s that there is no worth in studying the German performances because they destroy the spirit of original Mozart. Um, in fact, even as recently as uh, uh, in 2013 there was an article uh, published by a Czech musicologist that was still saying that the German language performances in early 19th century Prague are unworthy of study because uh, they destroy the spirit of original Mozart whereas the Czechs are trying to uh, make, make him more authentic. Um, and so that then brings me to the uh, translation of Così fan tutte. Uh, which was finished in 1825 but was performed only in 1831. It was done by František Schier, who was another of these intellectuals. So it's also a translation in the Chasomira, in the accentual uh, system. And uh, this translation was in fact unknown. Uh, so people knew that it existed, um, but no one really, uh, everyone thought it was, it was lost. And uh, I found that translation two years ago um, in, uh, in the National Theater Archive in Prague. And interestingly, I found it in another of these prompters scores. Um, so a score that was used during the uh, performances of the operas to feed lines, forgotten lines to the singers. Um, the interesting thing is that of course at that time when this was used in the 1820s, 18 teens, uh, the Estates Theatre was bilingual. So there was a German company and a Czech company and they shared materials. Um, and so that's why the score is mainly in German and has all these German texts. So I think this upper text, you cannot see it very well, but if you could, there's two texts below the vocal line. One of them is German. And then I was looking at the lower text uh, and it's, it's, it's written in the German script uh, and so I at first thought it was also a German uh, text but then I started reading it and it was actually Czech text and so uh, there, was the, there was the Czech translation of Così fan tutte that, that everyone thought uh, uh, was lost. Um, and uh, I think one of the reasons why people haven't noticed that uh, before, um, that the translation in fact existed in this manuscript materials, ironically has to do with Czech nationalism. Again, because uh, most people thought that, oh, there's no point studying these German scores uh, because they are just uh, showing these destroyed, this destruction of Mozart's spirit in the early 19th century uh, by the Germans. Um, but uh, that, uh, that, that wasn't really the case. So there was the, the Czech translation of Così fan tutte. And I guess... Uh, I mean, it was written in Gothic script, is that what you said? Yes. Uh -huh. Gothic script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. German. Uh -huh. So yeah, it, it, it looks German even though it's in fact Czech. Uh -huh. um, the other problem of course is that Czech, the Czech language during this time uh, still does not have a standardized orthography uh, or spelling rules and so that, that, that's another problem and so it's, it's, it's really a uh, bizarre uh, uh, example of Czech poetry from that time. And so that then led me to look at other um, uh, prompter scores and other scores that uh, uh, on the surface seem German um, and so then eventually I was also able to find uh, the first Czech translation of the marriage of Figaro uh, which was created in uh, 1852 um, uh, also in one of these uh, in one of these prompter score scores and Interestingly, again, uh, as my project develops, uh, it's, it's, uh, I feel that these translations and these productions uh, provide a really interesting window into the development of Czech culture and Czech society uh, because the Figaro translation was created in 1852, so that's uh, after the revolutions of 1848, um, the time when uh, the Austrian government started sort of a neo-absolutist regime and uh, was stepping down on the uh, Czech 
national movement and it's actually reflected in the translation because whereas the 1820s translations are uh, very idealistic and use these accentual uh, system and try to be as close to the original Italian as possible um, the Figaro translation is just a very basic translation of the German text that's in the uh, in the score, and it doesn't try to um, doesn't try to stick to any sort of ideals about uh, poetry and, and and language and and, and poetic systems. So it was just uh, mainly a functional uh, uh, translations translation as opposed to these idealistic uh, translations from a, a, a few de decades earlier. And so again, I think uh, for me, uh, these adaptations and translations are a really interesting window into the development of Czech culture, but also the development of Czech-German relations uh, in, in Prague, and also the development of uh, what we call uh, the cultural canon, right? How exactly did uh, these, these works that we call nowadays masterpieces and consider them sort of museum pieces that need to be preserved, how exactly they came into being. And interestingly, in the 1820s, it seems that this museum mentality, uh, sort of preserving the original and being as authentic as possible, was very closely linked to nationalism. Um, and that, in fact, then starts happening later in the 19th century in other places in, in, in Europe as well. So. I think I'll stop there, um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.